which actually came from a Partington resident um, uh, earlier on today, uh, Taylor. I sent it through to you. Um, so, yeah. OK, yep. so mm -hmm. shall we make a start? Oh, yes. yeah, by all means. Uh, thank you, Marge. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, oh, someone else is coming in. Um, we're obviously aware that a lot of you are very familiar with the, the project and, and the broader High Net Northwest scheme. Um, so we have taken out some of those introductory slides uh, that we've presented on the online events, for example. Um, so that should allow us a little bit more time to answer questions as well at the end. Um, so we'll have a, a quick look at the agenda first. So I'll uh, I'll quickly introduce you to the team, although I know you're familiar with with me and and with Dave anyway. Um, we'll then provide a, an overview of the the statutory consultation. Um, we'll look at the, the project and and the route of the pipeline in a little more detail. Uh, we'll touch on our our work to date and how our proposals have developed since the first consultation earlier this year. And obviously we we met you at that first consultation as well. Um, then we'll touch on on the next steps and I guess what the DCO process looks like beyond statutory consultation before we uh, we run through those questions. So we've obviously got myself on the call today, so I, I lead on the, the community relations and stakeholder engagement aspect of the project. Uh, we've got Dave Kenyon, uh, who's our planning lead, uh, and we've also got Elizabeth on the call, who's our ecologist expert, so she's going to wait in the wings and until we're ready to, to answer some questions later on. So just briefly running through through these slides so that the high net Northwest hydrogen pipeline is uh, is being developed by Caden, who are the gas network operator for the region. Uh, so Caden currently ensures the safe delivery of, of gas to around 11 million homes across the country. Uh, this pipeline project uh, forms a crucial part of High Net Northwest low carbon cl cluster, which you're aware of. Um, and the project is a, a nationally significant infrastructure project or, or NSIP as, as we commonly refer to it as. So that means that the project is governed by the Planning Act 2008, uh, and that requires us to apply to the Planning Inspector and Secretary of State for a development consent order. Um, and this consultation, the consultation that we ran earlier in this year and, and all of the feedback that we gather forms a crucial part of that DCO process. So High Net Northwest uh, is, a, is a groundbreaking energy project, so it will help decarbonize various uh, industrial customers across the, the Northwest. Uh, it will also present the potential for blended hydrogen, so that's a, a blend of natural gas and, and low carbon hydrogen to be introduced into the existing network. Um, Highnet Northwest, in a nutshell, will produce, store and distribute hydrogen. Uh, it will also capture and store carbon emissions from industry. Um, so the key question this slide answers is, is why are we doing all this? So as you can see, this, this project is underpinned and driven by national policy. Uh, so the UK government published a hydrogen strategy in August last year. That set a target of around five gigawatts of, of low carbon or hydrogen production capacity by 2030. That target was then doubled to 10 gigawatts by 2030 in the UK's energy security strategy published earlier this year. Uh, and then in May this year in the Queen's speech, an energy security bill was announced to deliver on the commitment to build a sustainable homegrown energy system uh, that is secure, clean and affordable. Um, Low carbon hydrogen transportation, like the High Net Northwest hydrogen pipeline, uh, will play an important role in delivering this bill. Uh, so we touched on the project being uh, an, an NSIP. Uh, so just to provide a, a quick summary of the consenting process. Uh, so that means that we'll apply to the Planning Inspector and Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy uh, for something called a Development Consent Order. And that all happens in accordance with the Planning Act 2008. Um, as part of this process, and as we've touched on, uh, we held a non-statutory stage of consultation earlier in the year, uh, and we'll touch on how our proposals have, have moved on from then. Uh, we're now in the middle of a, a second statutory stage of consultation, so that was open from the 12th of September, uh, and it will close on the 10th of November. As you can see from the, the timeline on the right of your screen, we expect to submit our application in spring next year. 
Uh, we then anticipate a decision from the Secretary of State at some point in 2024. Uh, and all being well, we expect to begin construction in 2025. Uh, and from then, we expect construction to take around two years. Uh, so hopefully online at some point in 2027. So just a, a quick summary of, of what we're actually presenting at this consultation. So we have refined preliminary order limits. That's the, the red shaded area that you can see on the map. And if, if you received one of our consultation postcards, that's the, the simplified map that you will have seen. Uh, within, these laps, uh, within these limits, we've identified an indicative pipeline centerline. Uh, we've presented some pipeline route options, which Dave will take you through in a second. Uh, potential hydrogen above ground installation locations and block valve installation locations. Um, so initially the pipeline will transport low carbon blue hydrogen that will be produced by Vertex Hydrogen at, uh, at the Stanley Manufacturing Complex. Uh, although the pipeline will be able to accommodate other hydrogen producers uh, and potentially all types of hydrogen in the future. Uh, as I said, the pipeline network presents the potential for introducing blended hydrogen into the existing gas network in the northwest. Uh, and as, as mentioned, at certain points along the pipeline, we will need some above ground infrastructure. So uh, we're calling them the rather long winded hydrogen above ground installations or, or HAGIs, HAGIs for short, and, and block valve installations or BVIs for short. Uh, the pipeline will also link to underground hydrogen storage facilities. Uh, and they will be used to help balance supply and demand. Okay, so then this slide just summarizes how our proposals have developed since, since that first consultation earlier in the year. So as you can see on the right there, we've shown the, the old consultation map. Uh, so at that point, we were presenting broad route corridors within which we could route the pipeline and search areas for our hadjis. Uh, since then, we've we've worked on our design and, and refined our plans uh, and that was informed by by the feedback that we collected during that first consultation uh, as well as, as as the technical engineering and environmental work that we did since then uh, and we've also been engaging with with stakeholders and, and local interest groups like yourself uh, so as i say that work allowed us to refine our proposals develop preliminary order limits or, or sometimes referred to as a red line boundary uh, and those order limits represent the maximum area that we think we'll need to build the project. Uh, and as I say, within these limits, we've got the indicative pipeline center line, uh, but we are yet to de determine the final exact location of, of some infrastructure. Um, so that means that we're, we're presenting and asking for feedback on, on pipeline route options and potential locations for that above ground infrastructure at certain points. Uh, and as I say, Dave will take you through some of that shortly. So just to recap, consultation will close on, on the 10th of November. We're encouraging feedback and we, we have had a, a good amount of feedback so far. Uh, we've produced a, a number of materials to help people understand the project in more detail. And, and hopefully you've, you've had the chance to, to take a look at some of those. Uh, we distributed a, a consultation postcard, which some of you may have received. So that went to around 20,000 addresses across the project area. Uh, we have a, a consultation brochure which provides a, a good overview of, the, of our proposals. Uh, the project website really is the, the hub of, of information, so that's got all of the documents explaining our proposals in, in more detail. And it's got a useful interactive feedback map, so that actually allows you to, to search by postcode, uh, view proposals in, in high detail in relation to specific addresses, and leave specific feedback at, at certain points as well. Um, there's a design evolution report, so that provides background to and, and summarizes the need for, for the project. It also looks at, at the different options uh, and alternatives we considered before, before we arrived at the proposals that we're presenting at this consultation. Uh, and then finally, we, we do have a, a preliminary environmental information report. It's quite long, it's over 4,000 pages. Uh, so we've produced a, a non-technical summary. So that's a, a plain English, more accessible way of, of, of reading the peer, if you like. Um, and then as you can see on, on the right hand side of the screen, there are a number of ways that people can provide feedback. So they can do that via the project website. Uh, they can email us, write to us, or come and see us at, at one of our consultation events and complete a hard copy feedback form. Uh, we've already done seven of those. They've been well attended. Um, it was good to, to meet Marge at one of those as well. We do still have two more remaining 
this Friday and next Monday uh, if you're free and able to come down. Uh, so that's over to you, Dave, to, to go through the route and various other okay. bits and pieces. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will spin through these a bit because I appreciate yeah. your, your focus mainly on what we call the eastern leg, I mean, it's northeastern leg, really. So uh, I want to give as much time for sort of discussion as possible, really. So I'm trying to be quick. But as, as Taylor explained, we've, we've gone down from some quite wide corridors, which we um, use both for our environmental scoping um, and also for our non statutory consultation. And we've we've ended up or we've resulted at the moment in a in a um, an area of land which is substantially less but still substantial. Um, and we have a number of options on the number of legs, albeit that the um, the leg up to Carrington um, has options in terms of lot valves. But other than that, it's it's a fairly um, straightforward sort of route across open countryside in in most areas until obviously you get up towards uh, Partington. And, and Carrington really. Um, I'll run through them briefly, but as I said, um, I won't want to spend too much time on the other legs. Next one, please. So just before going on to the, the corridors themselves, I just want to just talk a little bit about hedges. So in, in terms of um, the area that, we, that you're interested in, effects around um, Carrington, uh, we will have a, a hedge this uh, above ground installation, and that will be sited on the um, on the, in, within the existing industrial area to the north of um, the, the former um, sort of Hill and railway line, which is now identified as a sort of a sustainable transport link. So um, north of um, sort of the residential area of Partington and, and, and also the proposed residential areas as well. Um, in but there's totally, one, Dave, excuse yeah. me, there's one at Warburton as well, isn't there? Sorry, there's one at Warburton as well. I was yeah. thinking more of yeah. yeah. So we've got two, sorry. Um, one down, well, part, I, yeah, I call it part, but one, yeah. Um, so we have two, that's an existing um, above ground installation operated by Cadence at the moment for natural gas. Um, and the idea, the intention is that we would then um, locate this new hydrogen one alongside that um, to enable that blending that, um, that Taylor referred to before. Um, so what are the hedges? hedges? Um, they're basically a gas substation, for want of a better description, and it's the point at which the pipe would come above ground um, to enable maintenance, access, um, pressure, um, changes in pressure to be, be controlled um, at, a, at a sort of a defined location. Um, they, they lie quite low on the, on the landscape, really, so as you can see from the slide, they're effectively about a metre and a half to two metres high, and that really is the, the pipes as they, as they come above ground. Um, and in terms of size, the largest is what we call a central hub, um, and that's about one and a half hectares nominally at the moment, um, and, and they can range to down to a size of about half, half a hectare. Um, there are slides that we'll come on to shortly, which explain that they're not manned permanently, uh, they're not lit every night, um, only when, when people obviously need to get access um, to those sites. Next slide, please. So block valves, these are a, a smaller, a smaller brother, younger brother of the, the Hadji, really. Uh, we like to need a couple of block valves, uh, and these are placed um, when the pipeline is a, of such a length between Hadjis that there needs to be a, a sort of a secondary point to enable um, access, um, repair, and as it says, the you know, safety sort of close, closing down. So, for example, you need to get into a pipe, have a pipe, um, you need to have somewhere you can sort of switch the switch the gas off, control the gas, and um, to enable you to, to access that pipe safely. Um, again, these are smaller than the hedges, but they would resemble very much the same sort of infrastructure with the pipe coming above ground um, to enable that, that access. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so what do these look like, both the block valves and the hedges? Well, as I explained earlier, um, effectively some pipes that come above ground um, and, and allow that access, as you can see there on the on the, uh, the right hand photograph. In terms of buildings, we're unlikely to have buildings at, at um, Carrington. Um, there will probably be a GRP compound. Um, but in terms of a building, particularly a building for staff, for example, that's only likely to be in the central hub, which is um, sort of north of Tarpoli. Um, and, and that 
but that's where we have all four main pipes coming into a central location and, and it may well be that we have a small sort of um, building there for, for, for staff because um, it's like that would be a place where people visit more often than say some of these other locations. The purpose of the Hadji as well is really to allow that connection into the into the customer. So again, for Carrington and Carrington Power, for example, it's where their pipe would would connect into to Cadence uh, network. Um, and going forward, if if hydrogen is developed out across the northwest, it's these Hadji locations which will be the sort of the tee off points in some look in some instances um, to, to additional customers uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So looking at um, what we call the Northern Corridor, which is the link from the central hub, which you can see in the, in the sort of bottom right hand corner of this slide and um, up to St Helens in the north. Um, it has a number of uh, key constraints to cross. So we've got a few motorways, the, the M56, the M62. We've got uh, the Ship Canal, the River Mersey, um, and, and all points in between as well, really. Um, the purpose of going to St Helens is to access the glass manufacturers at Pilkington um, and, a, and, a, and a future proposal known as Glass Futures. Um, and as you can see, we have, um, ignoring the, the central hub, um, three hedges on, on this route, one at Higher Walton, um, Clock Face, and then at St Helens itself. Um, Higher Walton, there are options. So we've got this very, very um, so constrained part of the network there, where I mentioned we've got to cross the ship canal, the railways, etc. So we've got a couple of um, alternative routes at the moment, and that we're undertaking GI at present ground ground investigation works just to understand the sort of the makeup of the ground there and um, that will help us to determine which of those options um, we take forward obviously also reliant upon um, local uh, community groups to sort of advise as to which ones that they would um, prefer as well next one Taylor So looking at those options, I want to spin through these, but I just mentioned the one in the middle of the Hadji locations, and I was at a, at one of those yesterday where um, there's some grand investigation work taking place. Um, we're looking to run into Warrington itself to supply um, an existing company, the Novellis. Um, and as you'll see, that's the bottom image. It's very thin. Um, sort of area that, that's identified there. That's because the pipe in that location would be a plastic pipe and one that could fit in the highway. So it would be almost um, a standard sort of you know, domestic gas supply, really, which would run down the highway down to the client there. Also got some optioneering at the north, which to go around a festival site uh, where you get a, a sort of large sort of a gathering of people, tents going up and, and all that sort of stuff. So poles going in the ground, you know, it's always, uh, we're looking to sort of try and avoid as much as we can um, some of the key parts of, of the Creamfields Festival. Next slide, please. So this is the Eastern Corridor, and this one we'll come back to uh, no doubt when we get onto the questions. Um, so this is the one that takes us again from the central hub up to um, what we call the Partington or Carrington Hadji, um, especially in Carrington. Uh, we have that uh, additional Hadji that, that, that Marge referred to the at Warburton, and that is to that is to allow the potential for blending into the uh, the natural gas, the current natural gas supply that we all receive um, in our homes and businesses at the moment. Um, the blending itself um, would be up to 20%, so a little like um, petrol at the moment, um, unleaded fuel, which has 10% biodiesel, uh, there's the potential to, 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 to blend in a proportion of hydrogen into the domestic um, gas network, thereby reducing carbon emissions um, at the point of, of use. Uh, we've got a couple of block valves on, on this, or three options for block valves as well there. Yeah, Taylor's just showing them there. Again, we really not, um, don't really have a preference at the moment. I, I would probably suggest we'd go for the one closer, or one of the two closest to the highway, really, um, just for ease of access, but, but three locations there that we're looking for comments on as we go through consultation. Next slide, please. 
So as you can see, a bit the bottom valve central, a bit more detail. Um, and then the southern one is the hub, so the central hub. Again, we have a couple of um, alternative locations there for that central hub. But I, I, that's probably sufficient, suffice to say on that slide. Next. This is the Western corridor. It sort of comes last in the um, oh, second from last in the in the slide deck, but um, it's actually the starting point for the project. So it's where the hydrogen flows from. So where the hydrogen is created. Uh, that that is created um, at Stanlow. Um, I think it's fair to say that the production of hydrogen is not the responsibility of Caden. So a bit like um, National Grid uh, on electricity. Um, Cadence role and purpose is to transport gas, like grid transports energy. So Cadence doesn't generate the gas, whether it's natural gas or, or um, hydrogen, uh, and Cadence doesn't sell gas. That's obviously the eons, the British gases of this world as well. Cadence role is, a, is, a, is to transport the gas and, and it obviously takes a, a fee from the, from the suppliers and the, uh, and, the, and the gas suppliers for that purpose. So if the hydrogen would be generated um, at, at Stanlow and then it would run uh, alongside the M56, um, sort of parallel with that and the Mersey Estuary uh, crossover um, at Rock Savage. Um, and you can see a number of Hadji locations there. And then it would head uh, east towards the central hub location. Next slide, please. This is the final, um, and this takes us down to the storage facility um, south of North, which you can see at the bottom of the slide there. Um, have a number of options in this location. Um, again, it's all about physical features, really. So it's how do we well, yeah, physical and man-made features. How do we cross uh, the River Weaver navigation? How do we cross the West Coast Main Line? And how do we get over some quite challenging sort of topography as well? So um, before we get down to the, the storage, the sort of south west of, of north, which we've got a number of options uh, for crossing um, some key some key physical constraints there. The purpose of the storage is to balance the supply. So these are um, salt caverns um, that already have uh, a development consent order approval. Uh, for the storage of natural gas um, and um, the, the company that own those storage caverns in them, they are looking to uh, amend that condition to allow them to store hydrogen. Um, clearly, at the moment, as far as this scheme is concerned, and I know we'll talk about Carrington Power and, and the sort of green end hydrogen that they would produce, but as of the point in time at which this um, the information was pulled together for consultation, um, the focus was on Stanlow and, and the, the hydrogen production there. Clearly, if they need to shut down for maintenance you know, at any point, you can't have your hydrogen going offline. So the, the ability to have storage is to allow us to balance that supply and to ensure that it's a permanent um, supply to customers. OK, Taylor. In terms of construction, there are a number of well, number of specific techniques for crossings, which I'll come on to. But but generally, the approach to construction and the approach that would be the very much the predominant one on 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 the leg up to um to Partington and Carrington uh, would be the, the the one that you see on the left hand side of the screen and on, on the photograph as well. So this is known as open trench or open cut excavation, and it, it basically is as you'd expect. So the soil stripped. Um, topsoil subsoil is split um, and, and separated out and, and, and preserved on one side of the of the, um, the trench. Trench is dug, um, and all vehicles operate on the opposite side from the from the from the soil and the, and the subsoil. So we we protect that um, for future reinstatement. Um, once the trench is dug, the pipes are delivered and they are welded on site. And you can see on that photograph a little white tent, um, and it's within that little structure that the welding takes place. Once they're welded, they're then lifted by a number of um, cranes. You can see on the on the diagram, and then lowered into the uh, into the excavation before it's then backfilled and the land reinstated. 
so that's the sort of default, the, the sort of the approach to, to construction. But clearly, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of crossings that we need to, to achieve, be it rivers, railways, canals. And there are a number of different techniques that we can use for that, very much dependent upon the ground conditions um, and also the, the type of infrastructure cross. So I think I would say on behalf of the construction team that the favoured approach is the, probably the third one down, which is what we call horizontal directional drilling, HDD. Um, and that is one by which um, a drill is basically um, driven under the feature uh, to emerge at a safe distance the other side. Um, the drill is, is controlled remotely by a by someone with a effectively a, a joystick and and it, it's monitored um, uh, it, both its depth and its um, its horizontal and its vertical alignments can be can be um, sort of um, driven um, controlled by that joystick and it eventually emerges at the opposite side of the structure and then the, the hole is reamed made bigger and then eventually the the, the pipe is pulled through. In locations where that might not be possible, mainly due to, to ground conditions, then other approaches can be used. Um, also depend upon the size of the crossing as well. So, so we have, for example, uh, Orgabor, uh, which I think is the one at the top, uh, where basically um, the, the pipe is pushed through, rammed through. Uh, we have a form of tunneling, <laughs> forgot the name of it now, uh, second one down. Um, and then the final one is what we call a micro tunnel. Um, Di direct pipe, the second Direct one. pipe, okay, thank you. Um, of the four I mentioned HDD, the, the two are going to be micro tunnel or um, HDD, I think. I think the, the, the sort of the Ogbo may be possible under sort of small crossings, but, but generally uh, speaking to construction team, it's likely to be the, the, the bottom two. And again, they'll be dependent upon ground conditions. Can I tell that? You, yeah, you that's back me. Yeah. yeah, thanks Dave. Um, so I guess the, the key take out here is that this is is, is familiar work for, for Cadence. So Cadence being safely managing the UK's existing gas network for, for many, many years. And, and it's important to remember as well that hydrogen will be used in a similar way to natural gas. And, and that's been around for, for almost 200 years. Um, and as you'd expect, the pipeline will be built to meet all relevant standards, including the, the pipeline safety regulations. Uh, we're also working very closely with the health and safety, safety executive uh, to ensure the safety of the pipeline. Uh, the HSE is a statutory consultee, so we have, have reached out to them as part of the statutory consultation process, uh, and they will have the opportunity to, to review and provide feedback on our proposals. Uh, and then that's us. That, oh, sorry, no, one more to go. Next step. So, yeah, just a, a recap. Consultation will close on, on the 10th of November. Uh, once that's closed, as we did at, at non-statutory stage, we will consider people's feedback. Uh, we'll carry out more technical engineering and environmental work uh, and continue to engage with stakeholders. Uh, and that's all with the aim of, of finalising our design for the pipeline route and, uh, and the above ground infrastructure locations. Once we have that final design, we will submit our application for development consent to the Planning in Inspectorate and Secretary of State. Uh, and as I said, we expect to do that in spring of next year and for construction to begin in 2025 and then end at some point in 2027. Uh, and then that is all us, uh, from us. Uh, I just wanted to, to remind you that there are the two remaining events that you can see there on the right hand side. So we're at Thato Heath Library, St Helens from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, on Friday, this Friday, 28th of October. Uh, and we'll also be at Highley Village Hall from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Monday, 31st of October. So if you're free and able to come down, uh, it would be great to see you. We have a, a range of of members of the project team on hand to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and then a final reminder that there are a number of ways that you can provide feedback. So visit our website, email us. You can send written feedback to that free post address. Uh, or as I say, come and see us at one of those events, pick up a hard copy feedback form uh, and fill that out. OK, so that's that's all from us, Marge, if we want to, to move on to questions. Yeah, thanks. And I have had a another question sent in um 
to be honest. So, but we'll come back to that because Gay's got a hand up. Uh, and let me um, open the floor to Gay first. Uh, you need to come off mute, Gay. Mute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Marge. Um, we had a parish council meeting last night, and the councillors are spread about Warburton. You said that 20,000 cards had been distributed, but none of us have received anything. And it's not only the councillors, we've got residents that haven't heard anything at all. So I'm wondering if someone at KDENT has actually got a, um, a map plan of where these were circulated, because I've not found anyone who has knowledge of it. Well, I, I can take that one. So we, as I say, we wrote to around 20,000 people. We actually did it twice this time round, once at, at the beginning of consultation. And then, as, as you're aware, obviously, that the Queen then passed. So we rearranged consultation events. So then we sent another postcard with the new event schedule. Um, so we have a, a postcode plotting machine in our office. So what we do is we take the red line boundary that we, we showed you. Uh, we then find out all of the addresses within that location. And, and actually, we increased that that buffer uh, by a couple of hundred meters in, in certain locations as well. That then spits out a number of addresses, uh, 20,000 in this in this case, and, and we use the Royal Mail uh, to send those. Um, we, we have a list of of those addresses on our server here that we, we could share or, or we could look up some of the, the councillors addresses and, and show you where they are on the spreadsheet if they are on the spreadsheet. But what I would say is if they haven't received a postcard, then it's, it's likely it's because they fell outside of, of that consultation zone mapping uh, that we that we created. I think we could probably give the WA, is it 14, um, Gay? WA 13. 13, yeah. WA 13 postcode area, because um, that's Warburton. So it should have hit at least some people in Warburton, given the Haggy is going to be there. Yeah. Um, We've got Jan and Les, and I think Rich Marston is also in Partington. Um, did did you guys get a postcard? Uh, it's Richard. Uh, no, yeah. no, we haven't. And I don't know anybody else who's had one either. OK, um, thanks, Richard. Um, Janet, Jan, uh, sorry, can you come off mute? Just yeah. muting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, did you get a postcard? No. no. OK, so I think that's the M31 postcode. M31, yeah. So maybe you could take that away, um, uh, Taylor, and let us know about that, because um, clearly we do want to encourage as many people as possible to get involved in this. It is going to have quite a big impact on the people in Partington, Carrington and Warburton. So, OK. Yes. Yeah, um, no, we can we can look at that. I, I'm I'm just looking at the postcard mailing list now, and there are a whole host of addresses uh, with postcodes beginning M31. Um, so by all means, I can I can share that. That's that's not a problem. And the, the other thing I would say is is obviously a postcard is one way to engage in consultation. We we did do a whole host of of advertising. Uh, there were press releases. We've we've been engaging with groups like like yourself and and with with local councils and parish councils. So. Um, Apologies if, if you haven't received one. As I say, I'm I'm looking at a list here with a whole host of host of addresses in the M31 area, but happy to share that with you so that you can you can have a look after. And have a look at yeah, yeah. why why perhaps they fell out. Okay, yeah. um, Gay, did you have any other questions? Um, at this okay. stage? Yes, um, there yeah. are more. Um, the um, sorry. You said that uh, Cadent supplied uh, um, 11 million, your revenue is at yeah. 11 million countrywide, but how much is in the Northwest? Oh, good question. Um, good I, question. Will, I will say now that Taylor must have worked for Cadence so <laughs> and, and the planner, um, we probably have to come back to in terms of Northwest, but my understanding is that Cadence. I mean, once upon a time, everything was British gas. OK, it was a nationalised industry. And then, as we all know, the, the industry got split, became split. Um, and British gas sold its pipeline business. 
to what became, or it split its, its pipeline business into something that became called, known as Transco. And then I think Transco was then split up into, I think it's two companies really, effectively, in, 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 the, in the UK. Um, one of them being Cadence. So it's 11 million households um, is, is effectively what the, the number that the Cadence supplies. So my understanding is, is the whole of the Northwest Cadence, they work on geographical regions and, and one of those geographical regions that Cadence covers is the Northwest. But I'm sure we can find out, you know, the number of actual customers and households mm. um, and come back to you on that. I was just interested. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, the blue hydrogen um, yeah. ideally is for industry to yeah. save gas for households. Yeah. But you've only mentioned three companies. Uh, well, oh, there are a lot more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Prokington's Novellis. Yeah. Um, I do know that in um, Carrington there's the paper. Um, yes, Seiko, they're also, they're also supplied, yes. Yeah. Um, but that's not many businesses that you've got ready signed up. Yeah. Now, there, there are more, yeah. Very expensive. Yeah. And unless you've got the customers, I, I don't see it making economic sense there are there are a number of customers sorry i didn't go through all the different customers i'm just trying to find my notes now because i can't remember them all taylor's probably better than me on this but there are a, there are a number of so tartar chemicals for example south of uh, north of within north which i suppose you could call it um at rock savage so where we cross the um the m56 um, there is the Heath Business Park, which has a number of companies. There's also the, the chemical works at, at Rock Savage as well. Um, as you go up into Gen, uh, into Gen. Um, so there's probably, without um, finding my notes, um, there's probably about 12 or 13 customers as, as a minimum, really. The approach that was taken is that these are the customers that generate the greatest amount of carbon dioxide. So what um, the, uh, part of the consortium behind Hynek called Progressive Energy did was take um, the available data provided by, um, I think it's BASE, but one of the government departments which sets out the carbon emissions of industry and of individual industrial companies and then focused on the biggest emitters of carbon in the Northwest. Um, over the course of a number of, of months and, and years almost, negotiated and, and spoke with those companies to see whether they'd be interested in swapping over to hydrogen. Uh, and the result of that is that we have this, this number of customers now that are committed and signed up to HiNet. So they've all signed memorandums of understanding um, to, to talk, take part in, in what we call phase two. So the idea is that we we may get the biggest bangs for our buck in terms of carbon um, at this this point in time. So, for example, um, the Rock Savage plant, and this is from a previous project. This is not from this project, but I, I always recall hearing that that produces more CO two than the whole of Liverpool put together. You know, the no. because mm -hmm. the nature of the business. Another company which is part of the group, which is in phase one, which is much more localised hydrogen um, project, not part of our project, is Ensert Glass. They, they're also very close to Stanmore Oil Refinery. Again, if you're going down towards Chester, down the 56, you'll see CF Fertilisers, which has been in the paper recently about uh, the potential might close down. Um, you've got the Pure Wind Farm, CF Fertilisers, and then you have a, a building which is green horizontal stripes. That's the glass manufacturer. That's where they bottle all the all our beers and wines and everything. Um, they are part and parcel of, of, of the, the high net project as well, but as a different phase. So, and again, okay. I know they they use big big gas ovens, big gas furnaces as well. Really. So, okay. so that that's the intention. It's to hit the big the big producers, but the blending at Partington as well enables that opportunity to start blending into the, the domestic supply, you know, all our all our gas as well, really. So that's where we can start to make that um, transition really away from, from carbon um, emitting gas to, to sort of um, neutral gas. Yes. Mm, thank thank you, you, sir. To, okay. to answer, <laughs> oh, sorry, Mark, I was just going to say, to answer your first question, Gay, I've, I've dropped uh, a map into the, the chat, so it's 2.7 million homes across the Northwest, 21,000 miles of underground pipes, 
and hundreds of above ground stations. Uh, that's in the chat if, if anyone wanted to take a look at it. Super. I'll circulate that with the notes. And just before I hand over to Paul and then Richard, uh, yeah. Gay's question actually uh, links to the question that I got by email, which yes. was uh, about how much does the pipeline cost? Mm -hmm. um, what's the budget for the whole pipeline? So we understand that the budget, um, okay, the budget's around about five, around five hundred million. Okay. Um, so that's for one hundred and twenty-two ish kilometers depending on how we you know finalize the the route um and the purpose really of this route is it's it's the motorway it's the strategic network so the pipe is, is quite wide in you know the diameter is quite a large diameter in most locations um and effectively that that cross shape that we saw on the plans provides us with a north south east west um strategic network against which we can then into the future phases three and beyond start to connect in additional customers you know as as they come forward super so. and um, how much of that 500 million is public money um do you know my understanding is and this i have to qualify this this all uh, it's it's not the area that i'm a, i'm that familiar with really but my understanding is that it's it's um off gem who are the, the regulator basically allow generally allow whether it's united utilities and water it's water electrical gas they'll they give them the permission to effectively um spend that money but the the money is actually um bankroll's not the right word really but is 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 supported by government so, so the, the, the 500 is, million is hmm. is effectively all public money that is approved for spend I think through so, the yes. process. Yeah. OK, but I'll, okay. I, I might want to come back to you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so that's I'm not, fine. I'm not 100% on that. Okay. But, so, for example, I'll... I don't know if it, you know, the normal question is, does it go on our bills? I don't know whether it whether it does normally cadence business as usual. If they were putting new gas pipes. It's like the water industry, there's about, about sewage at the moment and what have you, you know, there's that conflict between spending the money to address an issue, but it puts money on the bills. I don't think that is the case with this hydrogen project because it's it's not business as usual. And I think it's there for um, through government, but I'll, um, I'll need to yeah. come back to you on Just that. Just come back yeah. to me on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Th yeah, that's the other half of the question. OK, yeah. let me hand over to Paul for his question and then I'll come to you Richard yeah thanks thanks Marge um I've actually got five questions including a, a supple <laughs> supplementary as well but if I start with the first one um the feedback form uh the consultation form your state will help in the obtaining of the DCO um but there's a recent letter to one of our residents which states that the DCO was granted on the 5th of July following an application on the 16th of May. So uh, does that mean that the feedback is then retrospective? I mean, surely you're, you're still going for the DCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't know what the letter is, maybe. No, that, that, I'd, that's be, totally that happen, so. I'd be very surprised if that was from us. I know there is a, a CO2 pipeline project that's kind of running concurrently to this and, and they're a little, a little bit ahead of us. So they've already submitted their DCO application. So it, it may be that that is what that letter is referring to, but I'm, I'm not not sure. No, but no, certainly that that isn't the case. And, and obviously people's feedback will inform the, the final design and we can't submit our application until we've got that final design. So, right. um, it, yeah, that's caused, sure caused that's a great deal of consternation to the individual concerned. Well, if, if you ask them to maybe ring our free phone number or something, yeah, like that. the, the CO2 you... pipeline is is stand low and, and out out yeah. to the west as well so it's not even mm -hmm. you know anyone living in in um carrington partington you know would not never be affected by the co2 pipeline yeah. so um, no paul could you sure, um sure. ask him to anonymize that letter and send it through yeah. and perhaps yeah. i can forward it to um to david yeah. And, yeah. and taylor yeah. and we can we can look at that yeah but then the, the supplementary was that um the eia scoping report um which was january this year indicated mm. some elements of the eia are still under consideration um so can you assure residents that 
um, and property properties affected, that their opinions and views will still count after the tenth of tenth uh, of November. Um, so, so yes, if, so, if there are properties affected. Yeah. So so the the approach is that we did non-statutory consultation along with scoping at the start yeah. of the year. Yeah. Uh, Receive comments. We now have the statutory phase. So. The, the regulations require you to do one round of consultation yeah. and statutory, but we did a non, we did an early one as well. So that is now. We then need to take that information along with all the other work we're doing, the environmental work that you mentioned, the EIA work, as well as the ground investigation, the technical work, you know, how, how can you construct it, pull all that together and then um, end up with a final scheme. So a design freeze is what we call it. Is we freeze the design. So right, this is where based on all that information, we think we're going to put the pipeline. Yeah, um, yeah. We need to lock that down to then allow us to undertake our assessment. So the process of environmental assessment is that you, you first of all have to understand the baseline. What are the environmental conditions now? Mm -hmm. So Carrington, for example, where's the, you know, the peaks and things like that. You then need to understand what it is is going to change, i.e. what is the development, and then you need to assess the impact of that development on those baseline conditions. Yeah, so, yeah. so once we've got the design freeze, which is likely to be in, in the new year, having taken on board everyone's comments, we then need to do the ES and, and do that assessment. So receiving people's comments after consultation and after design freeze, means that we have we have less opportunity to make a change because we have to draw the line somewhere so we can undertake our environmental yeah. assessments. Yeah. yeah. So as a, as, a, as a standing point, that would be that's the case. That said, if something came out, someone spoke to us about something which was so um, fundamental, you know, we can always, you know, stop and, and, and at least decide whether or not we, we should you know respond to it or not. Um, mm. We're also in discussions all the time with landowners and 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 there's a there will be, there's an ability within the um the application to allow us to to undertake minor modifications post consent. So for example, we'll we'll say this is where the pipeline is going to go a particular route, but we'll ask for what we call a limited deviation so we can put it within 10 meters we haven't we haven't determined the distance yet but let's say for argument's sake 10 meters either side so that if we do come to site and for example we put a spade in the ground and some archaeology there or a landowner says well actually something's occurred and you need to go to that through that field gate rather than that field gate we have an ability to sort of thread within that that limit of deviation i would find yeah. so I mean it's it's something I, I deal with quite a lot in you know, mm. stuff and yeah. um, I've been trying to reassure some of our residents that yeah. it's a sort of iterative process exactly and clearly you know there will be some deviations even when it's supposedly fixed you yes. know that there has yeah. to be. And in deviation. particular there's there's one area where we have a parish ditch now the mm -hmm. pipeline goes through the ditch twice right, uh, okay. that might be a thousand years old um so clearly, I think I know about the parish ditch. Up. Yes, um, but there yeah. may be other things. I don't know. Obviously, yeah. stuff will come out in the AI. Yeah, but, uh, I think is that parish ditch near the, the existing in Partington near the existing um, cadence no, this, existing one in that. This is Warburton Dunham. Uh, right. Okay. It probably is the same. I did. I did meet some people at the consultation that's last week who were pointing out a thousand-year-old ditch. So whether it was the same one or there more than one, I don't know. But yeah. 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 I did make a note of that actually, yes. Good, good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I'll I'll leave the others the other yeah, questions. Okay. To talk oh, about okay. Had their, their say. <laughs> we'll let yeah, Richard. we'll let Richard jump in now yeah. and then uh, I'll come back to you, Paul, then if that's okay. Mm, thank you. Yeah. So Richard, do you want to come off mute and hi David. Uh yeah, so my question is regarding um obviously there are a number of other projects going on around Partington mm -hmm. at the same time that this is going mm -hmm. on what sort of consultation between companies is occurring to prevent um, gridlock and further damage to the roads that are already pretty damaged? So obviously there's the power station, there's a proposed relief road, yeah. there's 6,000 houses being built around here. 
So there's a number of other projects that are also going to impact your ability to get to sites and things like that. So yeah. is there a consultation between companies to I suppose support residents? Um, yeah, for... I think I'd probably, probably to be fair, greater and lesser, depending on some some projects, probably more than others at the moment. So we've um, had no, obviously consultation with Carrington Power because they are ultimately one of our customers. Uh, we've also been obviously dealing with Chafford as well, and they're the planning authority, so obviously hold a lot of the information um, and actually behind indirectly and but in terms of how they allocate land um a lot of the land uses we've also um been in touch with um the developers behind some of the rest some of the residential development as well um to understand that the well first of all where they're looking to actually site the the area the, the residential development because we need to sort of come through that to get into into Carrington um, and then secondly it will be the, the sort of the effects of possibly parallel construction activities um, if, if they're still in you know in the ground as, as we are as we are coming through as well so I think I'd, to be fair I'd say they're ongoing at the moment but we have been in touch you know we have been in, in conversation with all, all the parties that we're aware of um, with regard to the the um the sort of count and relief road that that runs a little bit to the north really of where we're looking to go so i would hope that we don't have too much um interaction with with that but i am aware of the, of the, the sort of there are a number of sort of smaller um roads proposed um to open up the land um to the sort of um to the south of our of, of carrington really um so sort of, we call it a southern Relief Road or Southern, maybe that's not, Relief Road's not the right yeah, No, it is. It maybe. is called the Southern Relief Road. It is the Southern, okay, right. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and obviously that would cross, or we would cross it, it would cross us depending who got in first, really. No, you'd you'd be first on your current timetable. We will be, we will be. Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so I think the, just, I think sure the issue, we, though, um, David, if I can just interject that Richard was raising, is the, is the disruption caused by all this, uh, all these projects coming into the area so yeah. whilst you may not hit the Carrington Relief Road um, because of where Trafford is proposing to put it which is across the moss as well uh, Trafford's do own documents say that there will be 30 percent more HGV traffic as a consequence of where they want to build uh, compared with upgrading the existing yeah. road um, if you have HGV traffic, and, and to be fair, and I would uh, say this to everybody on the call, that I think um, Caden has been extremely open and transparent in the information that they've given, which isn't the same with all the documentation that we've received on some of the other projects. Um, so we're very grateful for that, and we'd encourage you to continue being open, honest and transparent. Um, and um, but. You know, if you are you say in your materials that you're going to put 158 HGVs a day on the road, if um, the Carrington Relief Road, because of where it's going, uh, has 30 percent more HGVs than it would have done if we were just upgrading the existing road. Uh, and if the power station becomes operational and puts a significant number of HGVs on the road, then that's an awful lot of additional HGVs that, that are going to impact the area. Um, and as anyone who lives here will tell you that we currently have 200 HGVs an hour um, uh, travelling to the Carrington Spur, to and from the Carrington Spur. So this is going to cause significant congestion and chaos, really. So, so um, all our environmental chapters in the EIA will have a cumulative section. So that yeah. cumulative looks, well, looks at a number of things, but what in, in relation to this point looks at our development taking place at the same time as as other developments. So what we would what we commonly do is we look at developments that have planning permission and that are ready to go, developments which are in for planning but maybe don't have permission yet. Developments which if the EIA are in for scoping, so someone's progressing them but they just haven't got that far yet. And then allocations as well. So it might be land that the council's allocated for development. No applications have come in, but we can still make some assumptions around the 
the vehicle, in this case, the vehicle movement. So that, that cumulative is all fed into um, a new baseline, so a future baseline in effect, which takes the vehicles now, adds in all those additional vehicles. And then on top of that, we then add in our own vehicle numbers and that then sort of churns out you know, through the process um, an understanding of the implications and consequently an assessment of significance and, and more importantly, mitigation, you know, the mitigation measures that need to be put in place. Um, so that, that will take place. That isn't in the peer at the moment, um, but that will form part of the environmental statement. The when other way when will that come so, out, David? Sorry. So that will, that will come out with the submission. Ah, right. So okay. that'll be with the, the other way of doing it, um, and I haven't spoken to the, the transport team about it you know, per se, is um, Department of Transport issues um, future baseline. So it basically factors in traffic growth year on year. So normally, if there's no big developments proposed, we were just looking at the normal increase in traffic, you would use the DFT numbers. But I think here, given the the nature of the area and, and the, the sort of almost the sort of the certainty of some of the development, you know, maybe not all, uh, we'd probably actually look at bespoke information from each development. Can okay. I can I tag something in quickly onto that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, vehicle movements on the A6144 in Warburton um, will be passing a number of historic buildings and some of them are listed and many of them have got very shallow foundations mm. and in the past, recent past, have suffered subsidence. So they'll be subject to vibration as construction vehicles and supply vehicles go past. Um, is that something that you'll take into consideration? So generally we consider vibration within the uh, what we call the noise and vibration assessment of the yeah. reported in the ES. Um, and that that certainly is, is part, of, part and parcel of um, what we're proposing for this project. Obviously, sometimes you can scope it out depending on the nature of the project. In terms of the yeah, vibration facts in historic buildings, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming we will, but I would just need to check and come back to you, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've not I've not confirmed that on the call, but I've made a note of that and we can come back on that. That's that's in the Moss Brow area of right, Warburton. Okay. Um, yeah. It's the junction between Dunham Road and Warburton Lane. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a little there's I, I know the buildings. area there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Super. Um, Brenda, just before I come to you, I just want to check with Richard that um, all his questions were covered there. Um, yes, you answered that extremely well thank you um the question was about investment no zones but i think as that's all up in the air at the moment it's not <laughs> asking that question oh yeah, it will be there, won't it? yeah. <laughs> okay thank you very much uh brenda did you have a question that you wanted to ask you put your hand up but it's gone down again now yeah i didn't realize i had my hand up until you said that oh the right moment. okay that's one thing that I was going to uh, sort of ask was, what route was you, was you thinking of to go through Partington? Route when you when you say route, so you mean the pipeline route or, or for the vehicles? Yeah, pipeline. Do you want me to share my screen? Yes, please. Uh, or I can share mine. I've got a little bit late, so yeah, okay. I've got a graphic from the um, environmental report. Uh, which I can, which I can uh, share. I can sh yeah. It may be. I've got. I've got one that I. Shall I? I could share you the one with. I'll shall I share one with a. Um, can you see? Photograph? Can you see this one yeah. or the one that's on my screen now? Am I yes. sharing? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So this is the. This is where the overground bit is going to be. You can see it's just below Common Lane. And right. um, there's plan to be links to Saker, to Basel, and then ultimately to Carrington Power Station. Now, one thing that I did ask at the um, the session at the Fuse, David, was why that pipeline didn't go all the way to Carrington Power Station. But um, I think it was Rebecca that told yeah. me that 
uh, it'll be Carrington Power Station that actually link into the pipeline rather than you that link into Carrington Power Station. So that they already have a permission to link into the existing Hartington Caden AGI because once upon a time they were looking you know, to, to generate or to use natural gas. Um, so my understanding is that effectively that would then be repurposed for the, the hydrogen, the the hadji rather than the hadji. Yeah. So yeah, so they so in this instance they come to us. Um in, in in lots of other instances we go to them being the customer. Yeah. I can dig it out. I, I, it was a while back now, but so I did dig out the, the Carrington Power uh, planning application actually it, it, it does show you the route actually. Yeah, I've got the other one, but just let me let in whoever is waiting in the in the uh I can't somebody in the well I was going to say I thought if somebody Brenda, was waiting but maybe not if Brenda wants to see the the area to the south I've got I've got the pipeline routes up available as well so yeah I've got this one which is um this is the route over uh, route down to Warburton. So that's the railway line, the disused railway line at the top, which will go into the pre which will go into that previous um drawing. Then you've got all the way down through the fields. Um, and some of this land, as you were saying, um David, uh, is planned for development within the places for everyone. Uh, development and then it we get to the Warburton uh, Haggy here. So, so you can see where the um where the the route alignment goes. Yeah. And you've got quite a wide space here, so presumably that's so that you can maneuver your pipeline if you need to, as you were saying earlier. Yes, that, that will come down. So the red line at the moment is quite wide in most locations, and, and that is um, sort of driven by the fact that we are still, or we were still preliminary. Um, yeah. But as a result of consultation um, and uh, technical work, we will be reducing that red line down. So. In most locations, it will come down to probably something not significantly greater than the dotted line that you see either side of the, the solid purple. So it will, it will come down quite a, quite a bit, really. So we'll have that that dotted is basically our de deviation that I mentioned before, uh, and yeah. we'll have obviously have some have to have land either side of that in case we move the pipeline one way or the other. But beyond that, we we'll, we we'll, we won't include any additional land because the pipeline. Caden is effectively putting the pattern on somebody else's land. It doesn't buy the land, it, it pays a, an easement for the land. Um, we have to take out, or we have to have a backstop of compulsory acquisition. And this does often um, upset landowners. Um, but clearly a linear, linear infrastructure, where it's a road, railway, pipeline you can't have a gap in the middle it needs to connect no so exactly. so if you have someone who delays and doesn't sign and, and all effectively um has a ransom then first of all it's not fair and other people who have signed but equally it prevents you getting the pipeline so as a backstop we have to have compulsory acquisition powers that said we're always looking to voluntarily um sign agreements um yeah. Because I mean, we're I going guess... compulsory, we have to reduce how we have to take the minimum land necessary. Yeah. We would challenge, you see, taking away people's rights effectively. So, sorry. Well, true. And, and for those people, those developers who are planning to um, use the land for housing development, clearly they won't be able to build houses on top of the pipeline. Yeah. So it reduces the value of the land in that location, doesn't it? Yeah. So what um, we're trying to do is to sort of move our to locate up in the top part here to try and locate our pipeline as best we can. Um, and you asked the, asked the question before: Are we are we liaising? Are we working with the the landowners? If I can just share my 
Yeah. Oh, I can find it. Oh, I can't even find it. Where is it gone? Long. Um, shouldn't have said that because I can't find it. Just while you're looking for that, <laughs> does the pipeline <laughs> um, prevent? Because one of the projects that we're looking at is the resurrection of the railway line, the former yes. railway line. So would the pipeline stop the railway line from being reopened over the top of it? As it no. were. Um, that was one of the questions that you sent through as an email. Yeah. I can, if I show this, I can answer both with this one slide actually. So, yeah, good. so this is an example of how we were are we working with the developers. So this is, as you'll be aware, this this part of the site is this area is being built at the moment. Um and, and then I can't remember the applicant's name now, but um they've then got an outline on this part of the of the um of the, of the land here this is um the railway line that we just spoke about there man so yes and this so, is Heath farm lane Heath isn't farm, it yes that's it yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so so our pipeline is coming up here and it comes yeah. in there so what we've looked to do in other words is is spot a spot a gap in the in the in the in the built-up area or the proposed built-up area and 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 fit our part line within that. So that you, that if, that route there, sorry, hmm. is that the disused? Uh, is that the other disused yes. railway line as well? Yeah, because we've got the yeah. disused railway going across yeah. that way, and then above we've got the spur of the disused railway line. So it's above the railway line. Right, okay. So is it in alignment with that? I mean, I can see. I think that's Toad Pond there, yeah, um, yeah. that we can just see at the top. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, for Elizabeth's uh, um, information, this land above is brownfield, but we've got to bear in mind that there is an awful lot of ecology there. Oh, yeah. And I think um, there's been a, an application for development by um, Cannon Blackrock. It's called, uh, um, oh, Voltage Park, I think it's mm -hmm. called. Um, and but this pond here is known locally as Toad Pond, and it is full of ecology. Just so you know, um, so we we just need to bear in mind that sometimes brownfield land, when it sort of when nature takes it back over, it can be uh, it can be quite valuable e ecologically, yeah. can't it? Oh yeah, so, we're fully aware of that. It's often better than arable fields and things. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, so the Future places or well, places for everyone. Places for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. I've got future yeah. Wales. I do as I said to you the meeting. I do future <laughs> Wales this morning. So um, I was combined the two. It does show this land here and land on this field to the south all for development as well. Yeah. Um, yeah but there is the gap the in the in the in, in the sort of land parcels. So basically, we look to come up here and then come across, and that matches the slide that you showed before. This would mean that we would cross this, um, they call it now sus sustainable sort of transport link out or something. Yeah. Um, we will probably, I'm sure we'll be in before that, that that is ever built really, particularly if it's rail, given yeah. my experience of, net of network rail. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're crossing railways in numerous locations, West Coast mainline, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, such as that so we will just when we put it in we will make sure that it's put into this to the standard that then allows future development you know does not constrain future development um in, in this location so mm -hmm. um you know whether that means you put some sort of concrete slabs over the yeah you have to go deeper or you put concrete slabs or the protection measures over over the pipe um, yeah. And there is a pipeline that runs up here, um, in this location already, so it's yeah. not as though it's, it's, you know, it has been done before, so to speak. Super. OK. Yeah. Um, now, we have got um, a question from Valerie in the chat. So, Paul, before we come back to you, I'll just go to Valerie's questions in the chat. Um, and she's asked about the emergency arrangement. If there were to be a leak, um, you know, how do we contain and identify it? And actually, that links to the new question that I got yeah. today, um, which I did send through, which uh, somebody from Partington asked me, um, what about the health and safety implications, the proximity to the coma zones? Um, and, you know, 
would would there be a danger to Partington and Carrington residents? Basically, is is the concern. So the way that leaks would be detected is is basically through um, changes in pressure in the pipeline. So what Cadent will produce, they will have they will have um, real time monitoring. I suppose is the easiest way to describe it of of the pipeline network. So the control center will have you know all, all the pressures sort of set out. So any 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 release obviously reduces pressure, um, and that that would that would basically trigger the alarms to enable Cadent to, to understand you know what's happening. Uh, I mentioned about block valves and how just sort of the opportunities to close down. Um, close down the pipeline at that point. Um, in terms of sort of hazards, then first and foremost, as Taylor mentioned, we are in discussions with health and safety executive. Even if this application was to be approved by um, the Secretary of State in terms of its planning merits, if the health and safety executive didn't accept that it was a safe system, it still wouldn't take place. So, irrespective of how, how we get on with this DCO process, there are other processes and procedures that you have to go through. Because hydrogen is being um, promoted by government and as a, as a sort of response to sort of climate change, um, there are other projects taking place around the country. So, the industry, Cade and, and others who are um, looking at hydrogen projects, are in sort of close discussions with the health and safety executive to basically um i suppose generate or agree standards national standards for these sorts of pipelines in the future so for example are the stand are the existing natural gas pipeline standards acceptable appropriate or do they need to be tweaked for the for the purposes of hydrogen in terms of hydrogen itself as a gas my understanding is it's it's different. It has different characteristics than natural gas. Um, so that, I mean, natural gas in itself is not a benign gas. We hear about houses, you know, gas explosions, things like that. Right. So it's not. So it's not. You know, it's not a benign um, gas. Um, it's it's different. So it's a heavier gas. So my understanding is that if there's a gas leak with 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 um, natural gas, it will tend to collect. So if you're in a hollow or a dip or something like that, it will it will collect. Um, it takes more probably to ignite it, but when it does ignite, it's probably a larger, um, more ferocious explosion because it's been sat around, it's, it's been building up. Hydrogen is a lighter gas, so it does disperse more. So it doesn't collect like natural gas, but it does ignite easier. But the explosion, again, is a different nature because it's it's not, you've not got the collection. So they've both got some things, pros and cons. And it's an, an industry's work with health and safety to understand, you know, whether those differences require a different approach in terms of standards and things. But, but ultimately, to answer the question, if we can't, don't get past the regulators on the health and safety side, it doesn't get built. And that, that ties in with a, my question, if I may, mm. um, which is that um, the Haggies are mentioned um, in the MAD section, a major accident yeah. and disaster section of the EIA. But there doesn't seem to be much information available on them, and I presume that refers to what you're saying about checking with health and safety. Um, but what assurances can you provide there'll not be a greatly increased risk to surrounding properties or footpaths from leaks, etc.? And this is bearing in mind that at the Warburton gas pumping station, where your haggy is going to be right mm. next door, mm. uh, residents have occasionally complained of strong smells of gas. And they've actually reported them many times. Right. Um, yeah. And I think the worry is that, you know, what happens if the balloon yeah. goes up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll be, and, and, be doing that risk yeah. assessment. Yes. And, and so, to I mean, be honest, just before you answer, David, the big issue for the people of Partington and Carrington is that this is not the only dangerous um, uh, business that's there. Yeah. You know, Basel is there, which is, um, quite inflammatory. Uh, air products, um, you know, is another one. So what they're, um, uh, 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 yes, Elisabetta, sorry, we didn't get to the ecology questions. We do have one from Valerie and, and we do have others, but perhaps we can pick those up by email if you don't mind. 
Um, super, thank you. Uh, so what the residents um, are concerned about is a ricochet reaction that if one business um, goes up, and I know we're going over our time, by the way, but um, uh, then what happens in terms of, of, you know, how do we contain this when there are so many other dangerous businesses that are uh, in the in close proximity to the pipeline? Um, I was going to answer the, the question. <laughs> I was going to respond to, to, to um, is it Ed, Edward or is it, are you Paul but masquerades? Paul but oh, masquerades right, okay. as Edward. Oh, yeah. okay, all right. um, <laughs> so I forgot I was going to answer that one there, sorry. Um, I, yeah, it's a difficult one. I am I'll go back to my default. I'm a town planner at the end of the day, so everything that I say should take with a pinch of salt, I suppose. But um, I mean, it's probably something best coming back to you from uh, probably take away and, and have a chat with Caden. I mean, generally speaking, um, I think to answer the question about the Hadjis, uh, as I mentioned before, we are they are they are they are liaising with the health and safety in terms of the gas smells. That's what it was. I do know that the existing um, Ground, above ground installations and the hedges will vent very occasionally. So um, as, a, as a pressure release, so obviously that you would then smell gas in, in that instance, but that, that wider piece of that happens more often. Again, I would have to go back to care and, and, and then get someone to respond to you uh, specifically about that. Um, and then, yes, I mean, we are coming into a by by uh, by the nature of the project it's coming into industrial areas and a number of these industrial areas of our customers are in their own right poma sites so these are sites which are sort of registered with with health and safety as as, as areas where um effectively there's a danger you know of if, if if an accident was to occur um it's the nature of the beast that, that those are the clients that we're tending to um to serve really so i think all cadent would say is that going back to Taylor slides, they've been operating gas pipelines for, for, for many, many years. They have very strict um, safety protocols in place. Clear the pipelines underground for a start, so we, we, they're not exposed. Um, and um, the, the thicknesses of the pipelines and, and the specifications will all be um, designed and, 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 and devised with, you know, obviously with a view to, to safety in mind. Really. Um, but I'd probably, I'd probably struggle to say much more than that, to be honest, Marge, not being No, no, there. no problem. I think we may need to pick this one up outside because I, yeah. I, I do know that this is a big concern for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just, Elizabeth, just before you go, um, we have water voles on Carrington Moss and the pipeline may be going quite close to their habitats. If there is a leak and, you know, how would it, in in the ground under the ground if you like how would it affect um you know water voles badgers um because you know as uh, i think val is saying in the uh, chat there that hydrogen is odorless colorless you know the, will the wildlife get out of their tunnels and sets and things you know that's a good question. I, I'll be honest, I don't think we have any precedence for it, but um, as uh, Taylor clarified that they will be adding um, odour to the hydrogen, so animals will be able to sense it and their natural instinct would be to get out, uh, out of the way whenever something isn't right. So I would think that they would get out of the way before things happen. But I don't think there's any precedence that I could quote to say that that is definitely that will definitely be the case. And I suppose it will depend also on the timing, isn't it? Uh, you know, from the leak to anything happening, what will be the time scale? Um, uh, and That's that because if it's immediate, then obviously nothing will get out. But if there's time, yeah. then animals will migrate. Yeah. And I, I don't know how or if hydrogen moves through ground. You know, I don't know whether. I mean, it is light, so I don't know how it how it permeates. How it permeates exactly. Permeates, so yeah. again, we can maybe take that one away or something yeah, and see yeah, if we can yeah. find that somebody who does know. Yeah. Apologies, yeah. all, but I do need to go. Yeah. But, uh, no yeah. Do send through yeah. the uh, questions, and we will respond. Yeah. yeah. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
And I am conscious that we have gone over time, but um, we do really appreciate you uh, you taking the time to to talk to us specifically. Um, we haven't gone through the question list that I sent um, earlier, but um, perhaps we can pick up on on those uh, outside of this meeting, yeah. and you know we can we can respond to those. Um, Paul, I think you just put another question yes. in the chat, which was about improving local biodiversity. Um, I know we've just lost it, Elizabeth, but do you guys have any thoughts on this? Or Yes, so you've probably heard about biodiversity net gain, which is we well something that keeps, keeps getting mentioned by, by government, but it hasn't been implemented yet for any type of application, but um, very much focused initially on, on time and country planning applications. So the, the normal applications that go into to the local authorities. It's not a requirement of um, national, national significant um, projects such as this one. Oh, we, need to, we need to change that then. Well, that we? said it's encouraged <laughs> and irrespective, uh, most developers are now doing it. So Caden is is proposing to do biodiversity net gain. So unfortunately, Elizabeth's just going. Um, but what we are doing is, first of all, back to the point I made earlier, you got to understand the baseline. So if you're looking at net gain, what are you what what are you gaining? So you need to understand what the biodiversity value is of the land that you're on at the moment, and then you can you can understand well it, it equates to X. Therefore, your gain then is X plus 10% normally in terms of biodiversity net gain. So what's happening at the moment is that the ecological surveyors are out there understanding the habitats, the species, um, et cetera, of the route uh, that you've seen on, and within that red line boundary. Once that is finalised, we can then we follow something called it's a DEFRA matrix or so Department of um, whatever, Rural Affairs, yeah. Farming Rural Affairs. The environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. That they have a, a very, very, very complex, in my view, um, sort of model that you can you can use to dem and it generates a number of units. So it, it, it basically breaks habitats and the condition of habitats down and then it, it spits out a number of units. So let's say we end up with 100 units. What we're then required to provide is 110 units to get 10% gain, clearly 20, 20 units for 20% gain, etc. So, so Caden is, is, is committed to biodiversity net gain. Um, we're doing that baseline now. We're also really keen to speak to people about where that gain could take place. Um, so there are companies setting up now already who will sell these units to developers. Um, Ideally, you get more bangs for your buck if you do it um, in the location within which the development is taking place. I mean, and just, also, just, if you do the same it. type of habitat that the one that you're affecting as well. I was going to say, Sorry, just Paul. to interject, um, yeah. you have got a fantastic opportunity to re-wet some of the peat soils mm. in the adjacent yeah. areas, yeah. Uh, which would be incredible biodiversity hit, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah worth looking at. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. The, the, obviously, the, and I, I, I agree, the, the, the issue there would be is that what the landowner wants, you know, can you can you can you persuade the landowner clearly? Um, if you can, great. I mean, you mentioned before um, Cheshire Wildlife Trust and we've had discussions and we'll be having a lot more discussion with Cheshire Wildlife Trust about any initiatives that they have and opportunities that, that we can sort of um, jump on board with there as well. Um, I think that's the the, the, with biodiversity, again, you would need the landowner on site because you have to commit, it's permanent. Okay. So it's, it's and you ha it has to be maintained, unlike in the past, you do something and then it gets forgotten about effectively. So, so 30 years minimum, so you need a commitment. I don't think we'd, we wouldn't be in the game of compulsory acquiring land to do it. Um, it'd have to be done in agreement with the landowner. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly and something we'd love to do. And the land where you put the pipeline through, mm. um, if it was agricultural land, would it be turned back into agricultural land after you've um, finished your pipeline so the farmer can continue farming his fields? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's reinstated to the use. Of so so the, the depth of the pipe is a minimum of, the top of the pipe is a bit minimum of 1.2 metres below the surface. And obviously, it could go deep depending on 
what's on the surface really, but a normal agricultural field, that's cadence work in depth, um, and that allows ploughing and, and normal farming activities to take place. And if Trafford, as you know, want to put the Southern Relief Road through, mm -hmm. then does your pipeline have to know about that beforehand, or can a road be built across the top of it in the same way as the railway can? It would be helpful to know about it, but I think the problem at the moment with, unless uh, have I have been looking online and maybe um, you know, to cast, I'm not sure to what extent that's been formally, you know, fixed. Um, the route, at, yeah. Know, the route and, and, and you know, the yeah. designs of that route. Uh, we are speaking with Warrington, for example, they've got a similar uh, relief road for Warrington Town Centre and we're speaking to their engineers about making sure that that you know that we can both work together and then ensure both can carry on with the project um so if it was fixed then i think we would probably put something in place i mean i'm speaking on behalf of engineers and cadently um if if it's still very much a sort of a line on a plan um and could could move a little bit i think really it's, it's going to be really one for the for the, uh, the the road builders to deal with what they'll have to do is is, is basically get the approval of Caden. I mean, it would be no different than all the pipes that Caden operates at the moment, natural gas all across the Northwest, where developers are proposing to build roads, you know, things like that. And then a bit like we are doing on our project, they need to go to Caden and get protective provisions in place to ensure that they can build over Caden's existing gas pipelines. So I cannot, you know, I'm sure it, it, it would not affect the, the implementation of that road. No. OK, and then I mean, I've just got one further question, but I'll just throw the floor open to others if anybody else wants to jump in, because um, I'm conscious that we probably need to wrap up. Um, I know we're going to, I think, Barbara, do our 200 club draw before we finish, but we don't need to have Taylor and, and David on for That's that. That's OK. Um, but... Um, does anybody want to um, ask any further questions of David or Taylor before we wrap up the questions? And if not, I have one final question. Oh, Gay okay. does. Gay, jump in. I was just wondering um, what uh, compensation will be paid to um, landowners that are inconvenienced by the by the route. Do you have a separate compensation department, for instance? Yes, so there's um, any any damage. So there's two two payments really. There's the, the standard payment for the pipeline, and that's um, so many pounds. I, I do not know the numbers, but it's so many pounds per meter of of pipeline on their land. So they would get that as a as a standard payment. Um, but then what would happen before work start is that a full photographic sort of survey is taken of of that ground and, and the land that will be used for access. The works take place um, and then any um, any loss of crop, for example, um, any any damage that might be caused and drive through a gate or something like that, all that is then compensated. So, so yes, the landowners have the ability, first of all, they have a payment anyway, but then any any if the land isn't being stated properly and there's, or, or the crop is damaged or there's just a loss of crop because they can't plant maybe for that summer because the pipeline is being put in, then they get compensated for loss of business. And that would be explained to them at the time? Yeah, that's explained, yeah, at the time. And, it's explained and contact to details? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Fisher well, German are uh, part of our team. They're, they're land agents and they're liaising with a lot. Of, a lot of the landowners have their own land agents or they may deal directly with the individual, depending. Um, so those compensation payments, um, they'll be very familiar to people who work in that that part of the, you know, that land that land agent part of the business. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Gay. Um, I just had one final question, which is about the blue and the green uh, mm -hmm. hydrogen. So, um, and it was just really something that you said at the very beginning, uh, Taylor, um, which was about the potential to take or to mix other um, types of hydrogen. Um, now, as we know, uh, Carrington Power Station is going to be green hydrogen and your, uh, is it Vertex? Your, um, they're going to be blue hydrogen, certainly at the beginning. 
Um, so when you say there's a potential to mix hydrogens, when Carrington Power Station get connected, is it a potential thing or is it because at the moment Carrington Power Station are planning to put an a really serious number of HGVs on the road. Um, when they're fully operational, I know that uh, it was estimated at something like 900 a day um, going to various places. Um, that certainly won't be happening from day one because they'll be building up the production capabilities and, and what have you. But even so, even in the early days of production, they're going to be putting a really serious number of HGVs on local roads. So the the idea that they could put their hydrogen straight into a, a pipeline would be really yeah. beneficial. Um, so is the mix of blue and green hydrogen just a potential at the moment or is it an actual thing, you know. And Sorry, I just come off mute. Yeah, um, I, I probably can't answer that in as much detail as, as you would like me to. I mean, at the moment, we describe the pipeline as, as colour agnostic or, or colour blind, which means that it, it will it will take whatever hydrogen we put in it. Um, at the moment, the intention is that that is blue hydrogen, as, as I say, there is the potential in the future for that to be green or for that to be blended into the existing gas network. I, I can't provide any more detail than that. I think Beck Evans is, is probably the lady that could, but she's on annual leave this week. I don't know it if you could good. add any, anything further, yeah. Dave. Not really. I think, to be fair, I think when we started the project, which was only 12 months ago, Harrington Power was going to be a customer. In other words, we were going to supply it with hydrogen. And I think what has happened in the last 12 months is it started to flip and that Carrington Power are now thinking, well, actually, we can supply you with hydrogen or the other customers with hydrogen. Um, and I think the, the, re the only reason why we're both self and tell a little bit hesitant is that we are not party to those those commercial discussions that we had had between Cade and, and, and Carrington Power. But certainly that's my understanding. Rather than us providing it to them, they're going to provide it to us. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, as it says, it's all good. It's, at the end of the day, it's hydrogen. It doesn't matter how yeah. it's produced. The gas is the same. Um, what Vertex provided was that that initial kickstart for the project by committing to, albeit deliver blue hydrogen, it meant there was a significant producer, which meant that those industrial customers we spoke about could commit with some confidence to actually receiving a guaranteed supply of hydrogen. Carrington Power at the time, I don't think was, you know, it was it latterly came on board with its proposals um, and more and more are coming on, not on board, but more and more are knocking on the door now. Now they're seeing our scheme and saying, well, we, we've been interested in some green hydrogen here or there as well. So so I think it's it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is actually generate that interest and that discussion. You mentioned phase three, there will be other phases as well that will come for the other customers and suppliers that will come forward. I'm sure quite soon as well, really. Um, yeah. But that's why we started. No, I mean, I, I really, I mean, obviously, here. obviously we want green hydrogen yeah. if we can get it, because <laughs> yeah, that yeah. makes the most sense. Yeah. But I really just wanted um, the comfort of knowing that that mixing the different types of hydrogen is actually possible. Yeah. It's, it's the same type of hydrogen. It's just produced different ways. That's no, different ways. Yeah. OK. But water's water, but it's yeah you know yeah. It's spring it's water it. or spring, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 it's all yeah. the same yeah but, but you can't drink all of it you know you wouldn't no. drink the toilet water would no, you no, you know no, <laughs> no but if you if you did um yeah oh, okay, sorry yeah no no that's fine and thank you i just want to say thank you so much both of you and uh, elizabetta for coming on to the call we really appreciate it um and for taking taking some time to look specifically at our issues um i will um pick up with you uh, afterwards about the questions that we didn't get to and a yeah. couple of things that we we've um sort of parked for for later um one final thing if we're doing an email response can that be just totally unstructured you don't mind if it's just a, an email giving our views um mm. 
on the pipeline because I think people are, are, are pretty interested in what's happening in their own area um, and you know so it, it might be easiest for them to send an email in. That's absolutely yeah. fine I mean we, we, we yeah. go through a process of, of breaking that down into key themes analyzing it logging it so absolutely it can come across in, in whatever form people want to send it that's fine. Super. Super. Well, listen, thank you again, guys. Okay. Really very much no appreciated. And we'll be in touch. We'll obviously need to have more discussions about the peat and the biodiversity yeah. and things like that. But, um, you know, be be good to keep in touch. All right. Thanks very much. OK. Nice thank you, everyone. guys. Really yeah, appreciate bye. it. Bye, bye for now. Bye. 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 And if anybody that's in the 200 Club wants to stay on and see if they're a winner this month, um, Barbara, I think, is going to do the the draw. Um, so let's... Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so... I was going to go back this week. Until right. this month. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, as always, thanks to everybody who's supporting our, our 200 Club. Um, this month we have 73 numbers in the draw. We have a first prize of £37, a second prize of £22 and a third prize of, I can't read my own writing, £7.50. <laughs> um, so I'll just give this a little, little bit of a shake. I'll tell you what, I'll take that big thing of lottery tickets out before I do that. I'll try that again. It's easier to shake them up in this, I've, di I've discovered. Um, so our first, I'll have a rummage around as well. Our first ticket is number number twenty six, which is, is Rebecca Schofield. Oh my goodness! Right, okay, super. Very lucky lady, is Rebecca. Yes. We mix them up every time, you know. Yes. <laughs> So that was the first prize. The second mm -hmm. prize is number 55, yeah. which is Troughton. Troughton, is that Oh, Bob it's... Troughton, yeah, yeah. And last but not least, the third prize is number 31, which is Liz Turner. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, I'll leave you to get in contact with them. And um, yes, yeah, super. So can I just ask people just before we close the call, um, does anybody have any other questions about either the hydrogen pipeline or anything else for that matter while we're, um, if, if you're not aware, the places for everyone hearing start next week. The Warburton Tollbridge public inquiry starts the following week. The Carrington Relief Road consultation is due out in November. There's a Trafford Design Code con series of consultations which are also happening in November and some of them are clashing with um, places for everyone consul uh, hearings. So um, we're going to be hoping we can get representatives to some of those sessions. Um, what else is going on? Um, there's a housing survey, a housing needs survey, which Trafford have set up, which finishes, I think, on the 18th of November. I will put details about these in our next newsletter and get that out as soon as possible so that um, so that you have the chance of being playing part in those things. But uh there's a lot going on in this area at the moment. So um, so I know I can see Gay's got a hand up. So jump in, Gay. And we, if anybody else has got any questions, um, we will we'll can spend a bit of time just looking at those now. So, okay. well, number one, Marge, you've just said a lot going on in this area at the moment. And when I was asked to become a councillor, um, I asked what what happened, what what was going on. Oh, not a lot. <laughs> and things have changed in, in the few years. Um, but my hand was raised. Just, I, I'd like someone to remind me what my number is, please. <laughs> Barbara can do that. Um, so uh, I'll let Barbara yes, just... Sorry. 
Uh, yep. Yeah. And where? What? What on my sheet? Okay. Sorry. What's? Okay. Okay. Dave, Dave Fletcher. Yeah. Um, okay. Just bear with me. Hey Fletcher, your number is number twenty-four. Oh, thank you very much. You're very um, much. <laughs> and will you be in touch when it becomes due for renewal? I most certainly will. That's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will. You will get an email to say your 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 membership has expired. Do you want to rejoin? So uh, so That's yeah. Fine. Thank you, Barbara. Watch out for an email from me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions, uh, guys, tonight? Are you all okay? Well, we'll we'll call it to a close. In fact, I'll stop the recording now and um,